Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Mornings with Mara this morning in, what month are we? May. <laughs> I can't believe how quickly time has flown. Happy Mother's Day to those of you who are out there, and hope you had a great weekend last weekend. And it's shocking to me that it's Memorial Day, not too far in the future. So today we're talking about taking meaningful action and that it requires courage. And so I've got a book that we're going to focus on mostly called Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. Um, but before we get started with that, I just want to remind everybody, we do have a Facebook page. You're welcome to follow us on it. Um, there's a few conversations that happen here and there, but I'm also looking for ideas for other programming. So if you can provide that, that'd be great. And I think you'll see that the next month is pretty busy with programs, so it might be a little bit before we do another Mornings with Marit, but plenty of material and resources available to you as we go through the, the coming months. I did find this uh, quote fairly interesting <laughs> when I was getting ready for this presentation where she actually says, no plan survives its collision with reality. The problem is reality has an irritating habit of shifting and things change. <laughs> um, and she goes on to say, the world will not be managed. And I can certainly um, say that that's how we feel these days when, when we're looking at what we're, we're facing and how we're going to be dealing with different situations. And so today is really about how do you get grounded in um, shaping your conversations, not only with your coworkers and your employees and your management team, but perhaps even at home? How do you have those conversations and handle them? I'm actually going to explore three different books today, mostly Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. But as I was reading through her material, I found that there was a lot of commonalities with a couple other books. One is the Five Temptations of a CEO, which is by Patrick Winchoni. Um, if you have not read that, it's a very quick read. Um, it, it really describes the five common leadership pit, pitfalls um, that, that experienced managers can find themselves guilty of. And I'll cover those a little bit today. But it's an easy read. Um, you don't have to be a CEO to make it worthwhile for yourself. Um, but I would certainly recommend it. And then, of course, one of our favorites that we use in a lot of our programs, including our OPEX management program, is the culture code. So we're going to touch on some various pieces there. Um, but the conversational element is, is the focus today. But for us to have what we would consider fierce conversations, which is really about um, being able to come out from behind yourself and into the conversation and make it real, um, and having moral courage, courage clear requests, um, conducting business in a way that you're leading, um, making sure that it's a way of life. I really feel like it requires creating that environment of safety and permission. And um, there's actually a book out there called How to Say Anything to Anyone. And the whole context in that book is how do you create an environment and a process for making sure that um, coworkers, your staff, and yourself create an environment where you actually give each other permission for feedback. Because as you can imagine, if, if somebody doesn't want your feedback and they haven't given you permission, likely it's going to fall on deaf ears. So just the concept around that. But when we think about safety, um, I will reference to the book Culture Code because the first part of it is called building safety and making sure that people have that element of you are safe here. And, and nowadays, of course, we're talking about more than just safety emotionally, but, you know, safety safety emotionally through health um, issues as well. So I think it's expanded even further when you think about what that requires from a building safety standpoint. They actually have an interesting story. They talk about belonging cues and how important it is to connect with people before you interact um, from a standpoint of task and so forth. And they actually have this experiment that they did. And what they did was they actually went out and they had, in a rainy day, they, they walked around and asked people if they could borrow their phones. And they did it for a while, one way. And then the next way they did it, they walked up and they said, I'm so sorry about the rain. May I borrow your phone? And they actually had over 400% more success in actually acquiring somebody's phone and using it by just having that one moment of empathy, um, that one moment of belonging, that allows people to feel more comfortable with interacting with each other. So, you know, what are belonging cues? And I think these are key um, for being able to have those conversations that we're going to get into today. Um, the first piece is that you have to have energy in the moment. And, and, you know, we always talk about how it's so easy 
to get distracted. We have a million things going on. We've got text messages, we've got emails, the phones are ringing. Um, but when you're connecting with somebody, making sure that you're focused on that moment, the active listening component. Um, we'll even talk a little bit about today about allowing for silence. So when you're in that current exchange and people are asking questions and commenting, allowing for some quiet there between the exchange so you can process what you heard and you're not just focused on how am I going to respond. Um, also this concept of individualization. And individualization is really making sure that you treat people as unique individuals that are valued for what they bring to the table. And we talk about that all the time from a standpoint of getting to know your employees, getting to know them well, getting to know um, your customers. Um, so one size does not fit all. And this is the concept of don't treat people like you want to be treated, treat them like they want to be treated. But that does take an enormous amount of work to understand that. Um, but great leaders do that. Um, and, and really, I think this piece in the culture code is one that really I've never thought about before. I've always thought about, you know, be in the moment, you know, be present, treat people individually, but I've never thought about this piece about making sure that you create a future orientation and signal that the relationship will continue. By the way, I did put in a handout on this presentation, so if you want to download it, you're welcome to, and I will also send it out afterwards because I'm going to go through a lot of material today, and I know you're probably going to get tired writing. So. Um, we'll make sure that you have access to all of the documents. But this future orientation piece is so important, and, and especially if I'm having a difficult conversation with an employee, I, I, and I really want the outcome that they're part of the team, I begin the conversation with connecting to the future. Next year, when we're in this situation and, and we've accomplished all these goals, I'm so excited that we're going to celebrate together. Um, and then deal with the issue at hand as opposed to dealing with the issue and people get disconnected and wonder, am I safe here or not? Um, it really does um, create that scenario of safety. I, in this comment, I always tend to talk about like my son. You know, he never has to worry about whether or not he's around next year, right? So he knows that I'm always going to love him, and which means he has an environment of true safety. We're in this together. We're committed to the long haul, and, and that's what this relationship is going to be. So in the cultures, so one of the things about these conversations we're going to talk about today is if you don't have this type of culture already, you're probably going to have to spend some time on that. So people feel like, okay, we are close, we are safe, and we do share a future, um, because otherwise the conversations may fall, like I said, on um, deaf ears, or it may look disingenuous, which certainly isn't going to be helpful. So safety does allow for people to be honest um, and challenge ideas and really have those, those conversations. So when we talk about fierce conversations, um, what is it, right? So I just kind of grabbed some comments around here, and, and I do like this first one, which is, look, each conversation we have, whether it's personally or professionally, will either enhance that relationship, flatline it, or take it down. Um, and so it's amazing how when you start to think about conversation really being the relationship, um, you maybe take a pause back and start to realize how important conversation is. Um, when she talks about a fierce conversation is one in which we come out from behind ourselves um, and make things real. And then she also talks about, how, you know, whoever said talk is cheap was totally mistaken because unreal conversations are incredibly expensive for both organizations and individuals. And we've all had them, right, where you, you look around and you think, I don't think that was for real at all. Um, and we, we could kind of talk about the fact that, hey, the real conversations are usually those water cooler conversations as opposed to in the boardroom or in the management room. So what you want to do is make sure there's no difference between the two. Um, what's happening in the parking lot now that we're not able to together. There's no water cooler, so who knows what the reality is. Um, but, but really fierce conversations she talks about, is about are about moral courage, clear requests, taking action. Um, fierce is an attitude. It's a way of conducting business, a way of leading, and a way of life is the concept. And, and I'm going to cover pieces of this, but obviously there's so much more in her, in her book. So, you know, hopefully this will be something that inspires folks to um, go out there and maybe learn a little bit more. So when we think about um, fierce conversations, she talks about interrogate reality, and there are three stages to interrogating reality. 
first identify the issue on the table and your proposed solution, okay, check to see that everyone understands. And I think this is a really key part because if we don't understand what is happening from a perspective, uh, if we don't agree that, that we understand what the issue is, um, we have, may have a problem trying to get to that solution. And then finally, check for agreement. Um, be sure to get everyone's input and resist the temptation to defend your idea. I feel like my slide might have frozen, so bear with me while I just click back and forth. Matt, I'm just going to do a call out to you because I think my slides froze. Here on the fierce con, we see the fierce conversation slide. Yeah, it should say interrogate reality. So I think I might have a problem there. So if you're looking at my slides on the handout, I'm on page 12 right now, um, where interrogate reality, provoke learning. Um, we talk about that. Um, so when you're doing a fierce conversation, at the end of the day, we want to interrogate reality, provoke learning, tackle tough challenges, and enrich the relationship overall. All right, it says my network is being established. Good. I think we've moved now to the right slide. Great. Well, that's always fun in the middle of the world. So what do we call it? Quarantine grace. We'll forgive each other when it's not perfect. All right, so when we talk about fierce conversations, one of the things I'd like to challenge you to do today is list the fierce conversations you need to have with others. Um, so what I'd like you to do is maybe jot down the name of a person or two that you know you need to have conversations with and maybe start to kind of jot what is the topic about, one or two topics that you have to have. And I know this is a lot of material, but like I said, you can have access to the handout and I'll send it out. But as you're getting prepared for conversations, these are the things you should be drilling down from a perspective of what you should be thinking about. So really identify your most pressing issue you know, what's going on, how long, how bad is it really? I'm gonna talk later about data and making sure that, you know, it doesn't, it isn't just a perception of there's a problem, but there's actual data to prove it. Um, really think about the current, the, the impact it has and who is it impacting? Is it impacting just you? Is it impacting others? Um, what's being produced out of it? Um, what are the opportunity costs associated with that type of behavior or the issue that you're gonna deal with? Um, also cl be clear about determining what are my, the future implications of continued activity that, that you may not be, find acceptable. Um, and this is a big one, and I find this in tons of materials, whether it's Critical Conversations or Radical Candor or any of those books. This is where it really is important that before you go into a conversation with somebody, you examine how you contributed to the situation. Um, we have a, an assessment, if anybody's interested, shoot me a, an email um, later. It's called the Thomas Kilman Conflict um, Assessment uh, um, Test. And it basically helps you walk through and un understand, you know, how do you deal with conflict? Are you somebody who is a competitor, so you'll get, get right at it and attack it? Or are you more of an avoider? Or do you accommodate? Or do you collaborate? Or do you compromise? Um, sometimes the way we handle situations, if we've been um, allowing it to happen, we may have contributed to the issue. And so when you begin conversations, you might have to own up to that. Look, you know, I didn't realize this was getting so far out of hand. I should have dealt with it earlier and addressed it with you. That's on me. But now we're in the situation, so let's talk about it. But own your your situation. I, I think there's a, there's a comment in here that talks about... Um, <laughs> What you tolerate is, is what gets acceptable, right? So then we also have I be clear about what the ideal outcome is. So what are you trying to accomplish at the end of the day? What do we, what does success look like? And then just make sure that you commit to action. So, you know, what's the most potent first step for me? What will get in the way and how will I get around it? And when do I start? So preparing for the conversations, if you've got some that you need to take a handle, um, please take advice on those and look at those. Another piece of um, this is uh, this is just a just a discussion format, right? So here's the issue. Be clear. Um, 
what is the root cause? Many of you know me. I'm always trying to drill down to why, 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 why is it happening? Um, and not look at the symptom, but try and get right down to the real issue. And it's significant because, so you're talking about what's at stake, um, my ideal outcome is, and this is where we talk about trying to be really clear about specificity and what is it that you actually want. And then from a standpoint of what are the relevant background data points, um, I did this, this book, um, How to Say Anything to Anybody, one of the rules they have, which I think is absolutely spot on, is you don't have the right to talk to somebody about a problem if it hasn't happened in the last week. You really have to address it right in the moment. You may need to sleep on it a little bit, but if things have been happening and then you let it go and then now it's a month later and you want to address it, it basically says you really don't have the right. You either have to wait for it to occur again and then deal with it, or it may never occur again, so then you don't deal with it. So I think it's important that you think through that. You know, what have I done up to this point to contribute? And, and then ask the help I want from the group is and, and put that on the table um, from a perspective of asking for feedback. All right. So some of you are going to be um, guilty of this. I know I'm sure guilty of some of these myself, but I love this list of common mistakes with one-on-one. Um, one is you do most of the talking. <laughs> um, we all know that whether you're a salesperson or a manager or anybody, the less talking you do and the more the client or the employee does, it's probably a better conversation. Um, also, taking the problem away from someone. So somebody will come to you and you say, oh, I'll deal with that. We really try and make sure that we end up in an environment where you put people in the room and they work it out themselves as opposed to solving it for them. Um, this one some of you might not love, um, but we want to ask people how they feel about situations, right? Um, and asking, well, how does that make you feel? I know it sounds goofy, but it actually is important and it's cathartic. Um, we also sometimes deliver unclear messages. I, I've heard people in culture code, they talk about be 10 times more clear than you thought you needed to be because people have their own filters and they go do their own thing. Here's a big one, don't cancel the meeting. Um, I know I am guilty of that at times where things just get busy and then cancel it and it's really a big no-no. Um, or allowing interruptions or not planning enough time um, or just assuming that it was effective at the end of the day. So those are some good common mistakes. You might be able to check some of those off for yourself and be aware of that. Um, here's another list of common errors in confronting behaviors that you might find helpful. Um, don't begin by asking how it's going. So, if you, so people kind of like to slide dog into it because it's a little uncomfortable to deal with it. Um, or even worse, they praise people as they lead in. Hey, I really want to thank you for all the stuff you've been doing this last week and handling this scenario. And then some, somehow they slide in some coaching um, and corrective action. Um, we talk about sandwich feedback, which people are brilliant at. Sometimes they lead with something positive, try to slide in the negative feedback, and then thank them for their great work at the end. And what you've done either is confuse the person because they're, they don't know what you're really talking about, or they only hear the good stuff or they only hear the bad. So just be very clear, cut right into what it is that you're dealing with. Um, we sometimes soften the message to avoid hurting pe people's feelings. And I like this comment, replace pillows with clear requests. Um, and people, frankly, will respect you for it. I actually worked for somebody years and years ago, and he did a 360 review. So all the employees turned in evaluations on him. And he, was, he let everybody get away with everything. And he thought he was being a nice guy, and they respected him. And his reviews were brutal because people knew they could run over him. And you, he wouldn't address the situation. So people actually appreciate it um, when you tackle situations. Um, you know, relationships work when there's both appreciation and confrontation in a healthy manner. Um, another uh, common error is we assume we know what the person will, will be saying, so then we don't really hear them. And so really pausing, parking your own perceptions of what's going to happen and allowing it for, for it to happen is, is important. And, and this one's also, people get nervous, and so they blast with a machine gun talk, um, and then they, they go straight to the issue, say it, and then, you know, they invite their partner to talk, but there's not really a conversation. So you really want to be pretty 
clear about it. I like to open up with tell me what you think is going on and let them talk as opposed to putting it all on the table um, and but still get through the guidance of it. In the book, um, Five Temptations of a CEO, they talk about a few things here, which I thought I'd highlight, that some temptations of CEOs or managers and so forth is, you know, there can be a, um, you know, it's natural to want to be liked by your peers, um, and, and most CEOs become friendly with their direct reports. Um, so there's no surprise when it comes to telling people they're not meeting expectations. When you get to that point, you balk because you've actually become more of a um, support group <laughs> uh, with your direct reports as opposed to people that you're holding accountable. So that's a key piece for, you know, great leaders really care about um, long-term respect, not affection. You know, don't view your direct reports as a support group, but as key employees who must deliver on their commitments at the companies to produce predictable results. Um, frankly, if the company doesn't meet their results, you as the leader are not doing them any favors by, by sliding that. So we want people to be held accountable. Also, sometimes we overthink things. And so we don't make decisions because we're, we're hoping that we got all the analytics correct. So there is some intuition that we've got to go with. And then sometimes what happens is we don't deal with issues because we want there to be harmony on the team. And I know quite a few people that I've talked to that said, yeah, it's so uncomfortable when my team gets, you know, debates issues. And the reality is that should be healthy and they should be in an environment where you're encouraging people to challenge your own ideas. Um, because that's healthy for the environment as well. Uh, I, that's something that's always a good reminder for folks. Clearly, if, if we can be vulnerable, people will then be more comfortable having these open, honest conversations. Here's just a comment in the book that I thought was important to maybe highlight is, you know, what are you pretending not to know? Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like the, I see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Um, you know, I think that when people start to pretend they can't see stuff, um, it will come back and, and backsplash them. And I, I've talked to, you know, a lot of agencies right now that, you know, haven't dealt with performance issues with their employees prior to COVID-19, and now they're working from home and they're having even more behavioral issues, and they're thinking, you know, I knew that, and I just pretended it wasn't happening. And as I always have talked about is that, you know, at the end of the day, your compassion for your employees should be for your higher performers and make sure that they have the best team around them. And just a reminder, as a leader, you get what you tolerate. So if you're tolerating certain behavior that because you just ignored it or you didn't want to deal with it and you didn't think it was worthwhile, if you allow it, um, you've now tolerated, which means you've now rewarded it as behavior that's acceptable for the organization. So Susan talks about, you know, a mineral rights conversation, digging in to find, you know, the gems, right? And so the outline of that conversation, and it, it lines up with what we talked about a few slides back, is, you know, what's the most important thing for us to talk about? You know, what's going to, on relative to this issue? How is it impacting you? How are you affected? What are the implications if nothing happens? Um, how have you contributed? What's the ideal outcome? And, you know, what's the most potent step you can take? So this is a great way when you're working with your employees, you want to deal with something, giving them this outline. Um, I know a lot of us will say at times, you know, it gets old when people just come in and complain to me. <laughs> well, you're tolerating it, right? So if you said to them, this is the outline. If you want to come in and talk about stuff with me, this is how I want us to approach it so that we're really dealing with the issue, talking about the impact, figuring out what the implications are, um, how we all it, and been part of this, and then really think through the ideal outcome. So this might be a helpful um, outline for you. They also had some good questions. There's a lot of good questions in here, but these I thought I would highlight for you. Um, if you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with your employees, these might be some things you might want to ask them. So. What has become clear since we last met? Um, what are you trying to make happen in the next three months? I think, you know, that's different than what are your goals, which may make people be a little bit more vulnerable about taking risks. Um, I love this one. So what's the most important decision you're facing? Um, I like, I love this. What topic are you hoping I won't bring up today? Um, 
you know, I'm a quick start and I used to work for a quick start and I knew that if she came down the hall and I didn't want to deal with what she was going to say, all I had to do was throw out an idea and she'd jump on that and forget why she came in. So it was brilliant, but um, it certainly wasn't helpful, <laughs> probably manipulative, but probably shouldn't air that on, on the airwaves out here, but that's how it goes. Um, you know, what part of your responsibilities are you avoiding right now? So that can drill down for a lot of reasons that maybe I don't have the skill, I don't have the talent for it, I may not like it, um, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit about motivated to do things and where, you, where you're committed as well. Um, what do you wish you had more time to do? And, and I love this one. If you were hired to consult with our company, what would you advise? Um, it's interesting how people wear the hat of, I'm going to talk about what somebody else would say. They can sometimes be more honest then this is how I feel and this is what we should do. So that's a nice opening statement for getting your employees to talk about things. I know we'll be incorporating some of these as we're dealing with COVID-19 and re-entry into the workplace. Um, these are going to be topics and questions that we're going to want to make sure we get feedback from our employees. So, you know, today what I wanted to spend a few minutes on are, are what are the difficult decisions that we may be faced with? Um, and, and so I thought I'd throw a few out to get you thinking about them. And, I, and I'm throwing them out not because they have to happen or they will happen. Um, they might all happen. But I think it's important as leaders that we start to have conversations and start to draw out strategies around this and get our employees' input on it um, so we're not just making um, reactive responses and policies as a result of whatever is happening. So one of the big ones, and I think I've probably talked to this with everybody that I've talked to in the last couple weeks has brought this up to me. What are we going to do when people say, I want to continue to work from home because it's worked and I'm more productive and I like it? And first of all, as a business, you have to decide, can you accommodate it and still handle your customer needs? I do think that customer needs are going to change just because people are starting to become more familiar and comfortable with remote, Zoom, all those kinds of tools. But I don't think people are going to completely go away from that social interaction and human interaction that we all like and we, we strive for. And we've talked about that in prior um, Mornings with Mara at workshops, too. So what I would make sure that you're doing as a leadership team is putting the issue on the table walking through some of these questions, figuring out w what you're uncomfortable with, why you're really uncomfortable, and, and also make sure that you're making decisions that are equitable. So making decisions about who can or can't work from home and a blended and so forth based on their functions, um, obviously not by any kind of discriminatory purpose. Um, but here's one that will be a really fun way to deal with a fierce conversation for you. <laughs> When somebody says, I've got two employees, both of them could work from home um, because they don't need to be in the office, but maybe, let's say, twice a week, but I don't trust one of them, and they're not a good performer, so how do I deal with that? Well, you deal with it by making sure that you've handled it and you're being direct with your employees, and you don't want to start managing and creating policies for the lowest common denominator on your staff. You want to create policies and strategies for your high performers and then as a manager deal with non-performance. And that's where you're going to have to have the courage to sit down and say to somebody, and I've had to do it before where I had somebody working from home part-time. We started having service issues, started to have complaints. I had to bring her in and say, I'm sorry, that benefit, which it really is a benefit, is no longer available to you because we don't have the performance levels that we need. Until we can get those corrected, you will be in the office doing the work. As you can imagine, it didn't last very long. But um, it's really important that you're, you have the courage to be direct with your employees about what's acceptable and what's not. And many of you have heard me talk about there's a difference between equal and equitable. And what you want to do is make sure that people understand what is equitable versus does it always have to look exactly the same. Um, and people have individual needs. Um, they're going to have medical needs that are different. They're going to have kids' needs that are different. What you don't want to do is end up in a situation where you say, well, all my single employees without kids have to come back to work, but all the ones with, with families, they get the accommodation. 
So you really want to balance what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and if you know me at all, I will always err on the side of precaution as long as performance is working. So if I have a performance issue, I'll deal with that. Um, I actually have you know somebody really well who said we've had to bring somebody back to work here. They're the only one really in the office because they were so disrupted at home and couldn't self-manage and so we've just had to make that accommodation in order to make sure that he still has a job at the end of the day. Another piece that we, we will be talking about too is clearly there could be a potential for shrinking business. We, you all have clients that are being affected by um, COVID-19, whether they're closing, whether their business models have changed, whether they have less income, and obviously that's going to translate, and we think it'll be six to nine months where we really start to see the impact with insurance agencies. What does that look like, and what is your plan for shrinking the business as far as personnel or downsizing? Suddenly, I talked to somebody the other day who said, you know, now that we've done this, I don't think we need a full staff here all the time. I think we can do more shared workspaces. Um, but now I don't need all this space that we've created. We're really going to revamp the office so it's made – set up for appointments for clients, not offices, and I don't need as much room as I used to. So these are things that I think now, starting to think through what are the scenarios that could happen, what's our strategy for that, because if you have a long-term vision of what the ideal situation is, whether it's culture and or performance and or productivity or quality, then as you end up getting pinched, and you end up in those difficult situations, your every decision you make gets you closer to the ideal strategy that you have, as opposed to starting to make either emotional decisions or ones that aren't tied to the greater context in which where you end up, want to end up. Um, we also know that we have to be careful about health precautions. And one thing that we were talking about as a group this morning is being clear about which governing bodies you're listening to and which governing bodies are your employees listening to. Um, and if somebody's nervous, they're probably listening to the most conservative one. Um, and if, if an employee feels like you are um, going against a policy that's out there and, and they believe that's the one that should be followed, they will hold you accountable to it. Um, I know Austin's an interesting situation because we have the state, county, and city all have different rules right now for stay at home. Well, which one are we following? I tend to follow the most conservative because that's probably the safest, but we're also performing extremely well without having being in the office, and a couple people are. But if we weren't, then I might have to take a different um, set, of, set of precautions and or plans for my staff. So those, are the, so those are some things. I guess the big message here is don't stick your head in the sand. Um, we know we're going to have to deal with these things. Why not get out ahead of it now um, and be thinking about where it is that you want to go? because we have to become data driven. And you're gonna see us this summer start to put out more and more tools for you to measure yourself. And I really think it's gonna be key to go back and benchmark yourself in 2019 so that you know how you ended the year, follow your data through 2020 and have a good picture of what's gonna happen in 21 so you know where to make um, the best decisions um, from a perspective of productivity and customer service. So our takeaways today, I've got a few more slides here, but, you know, just the concept of being fierce, I think, is an interesting one. You know, master the courage to interrogate reality and challenge that and get your employees to think about that. Um, come out from behind yourself into the conversation and make it real. Um, be here. Um, prepared to be nowhere else. Be present with your employees. Um, Tackle your toughest challenge today. I, I highly encourage, write down what is the biggest thing that I'm avoiding right now and figure out how to deal with it and use these formats that we provided. Um, and, and obey your instincts. Um, it's not always about the specifics. There may be, I just got this feeling. Well, then dig into that. Um, you know, take responsibility for the emotional wake, so to speak, that you create, you know, whether it's positive or negative. Um, we leave those behind us as we go through with our staff and work with them. And then, you know, a reminder of, you know, let silence do the heavy lifting. We, we fill space with time, let, we, we fill space with words. And so allowing people to process and think um, is really a key part of where we're headed here. Um, 
we said this earlier. So, you know, one conversation at a time, you're either building, destroying, or flatlining your relationship. So you walk away today and you just start to think, wow, every conversation I have actually has to have purpose. Um, would you choose different words the next go around and what kind of impact can you have? We covered this before, but I'm going to do it really quick because I think it, it begs a lot to say when you have a challenge that you're going to t tackle or you're worried about something, um, you want to make sure that you are at least at a level three in order to actually take action. So be honest with yourself. You know, um, are, do you just value it? You know, are you, do you just express a wish to get it done? Or do you actually, you know, kind of espouse for it or you're expressing an attitude or do you actually express conviction? Are you resolute about it and unambivalent? You have to be at that level in order for whatever piece you have actually will move you forward. Um, you might actually be passionate about it and be genuine and, and affirmative about it, or you could even have compassion about it, which is it's for the greater good. We have to do it. And it's an altruistic perspective. So whenever I take any goal or challenge or something I'm going to take, I always line myself up and be honest with myself about where is my emotional status from a motivation of tackling the issue and then what's my skill set you know do i just kind of know about it a little bit or you know can i actually um you know and analyze things and consider different pieces but you have to be at a level three to actually take action which means i can evaluate it i make conclusions i can discern it um, level four would be then I could convince you or persuade you. Um, and I have a perceptive of, of look at it versus five, having vision, that's really insightful, judicious, and so forth. And then what it comes down to is, are you actually going to do something with it? You know, are you just going to be kind of beginning to stir on things or are you kind of venturing into it, maybe try? Um, or are you committed? and um, really are self-determined and you have targeted efforts? Or do you even, are you vigilant and are you persistent? Are you resolute and have purpose? Or level five, I would say this, I'm on a mission from God, right? Like I'm on a crusade. We have to do this. It's compelling. Um, so when I look at this, I want to make sure that whatever I'm dealing with, I've got the, the motivation, the skill, and the time that I'm saying I'm actually committed to doing these pieces. And then what does that look like from a standpoint of a team, which is what we are, what we're working on with our teams right now, is the team just value it? Does the team have some ambition or does it actually have, and of course today's conversation is courage. Do we have courage to deal with things when things get tough? Um, a level four team will actually persevere, which is what we are going to need in the coming year. And level five is we have wisdom. And you as leaders can't just be interested or involved. You have to be engaged um, in order to participate in this, to take things to the next level. Um, you have to be in a position of convincing people. And hopefully, you're also in a position of inspiring people for the next step. So with that, I just want to introduce a couple things to you. I will send out an email after this. But there is a pro three series program, three hour program next week, one hour separated. Um, that a few states have gotten together and designed. We've got some big names. Steve Harville is going to do Jumpstart Tomorrow, Optimism in the New Future. Um, this, to me, is one I think everybody should listen to. Um, so I hope you'll register and, and watch that at 10 o'clock next Thursday. Um, then we'll have a program on leading managing and liability concerns. That's always been a big issue here that we keep at, getting asked about with your workforce. And then I love this one that we're going to do in the afternoon, which is best practices to protect your current book and your agency during the pandemic. And um, I, I think that you'll find that Dr. Williams is going to be doing that. I think you'll find that fascinating and very helpful for your business. So I hope you and your producers and your staff will join us. And then that in June, we're going to just jump into InsureCon. We actually have three days that are series Thursdays in June that we're going to be providing programming We'll make sure that you know what that is. We've got keynotes coming in. Steve McKee, we've got a whole bunch of Steve. Steve McKee, who's going to talk about disruption, um, growth in a time of disruption. We're going to have Steve Anderson talking about how to grow like Amazon. We're going to be talking about um, trends as it relates to COVID-19, whether it's work comp or E&O. And then we're going to be talking about technology 
whether it's cyber issues you need to be thinking about, um, and also from a perspective of, uh, you know, different tools and resources to work from home. So I want to thank everybody for joining us again today, and I hope you'll join us for the series of programming in June and next week, May 21st. And if anybody wants extra copies of anything, please let me know. Have a wonderful day and uh, make smart choices. <laughs>